thank you, um, Sue. So we're um, I'm going to talk to you for about 15 minutes about the development of our virtual midwifery caseload, and then I'm going to hand over to Claire, and she's going to talk to you about um, research study she did looking into the student midwife's experience of the virtual midwifery caseload. <laughs> We actually shorten it and we call it the VMC just for ease. So sometimes I might accidentally say the VMC and that's what I'm talking about. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please, Claire? So I just wanted to give um, a little bit of uh, context around the development of this. Um, and just at the outset, I want to um, just recognize my uh, colleague at the time when we were developing, um, Emma Wapples. She's a midwifery educator currently working for the University of Staffordshire. So when I talk about we quite a lot at the beginning, it's myself and Emma, and then Claire joined the team a little bit later. So <laughs> uh, I could also be talking about we, Claire and I, but I didn't want to um, not acknowledge Emma's input into this. Um, so we're actually talking here about, it's not a standalone learning and teaching innovation. Um, the development of the virtual midwifery case, which I will explain as we go through, actually emerged from the development of a whole new program and a whole new midwifery education portfolio at the University of Birmingham. So at the time of development, we were actually developing the um, MSc midwifery pre-registration short program for adult nurses who want to become uh, midwives. And before we actually um, introduced this program in October 2022, there was no education midwifery education programs at the University of Birmingham there was lots of high quality research going on um, but no education so what that actually meant was that we had a fantastic opportunity which most LMEs and midwifery program teams don't have which is we had no students uh, we had no existing programs so we had a, a, a reasonable amount of time we had lots of development to do but a reasonable amount of time to really explore and reflect on what elements what makes a really high quality educational experience for student midwives and what will actually bring high quality uh, midwives out into um, clinical practice. So that's um, that's sort of the, the context of the, the development itself. Thinking about the sort of nuts and bolts of it, there were a few drivers that presented us with challenges and opportunities. Um, when we were developing the program, we'd been funded to develop a blended learning program. Now, most of us were not used to uh, online platforms like this one today, uh, online teaching pre-COVID. So we needed to think about learning and teaching strategies that worked with students who were remote from us, who were having live sessions, but these sessions were um, over, a, 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 a Zoom, over Zoom or, or Teams. Um, as we move forward. Um, <clears throat> the programme had to design, uh, align with the University of Birmingham strategic intent. So what that, that means is every university has a strategic document that says what they want to achieve for their graduates um, or for their research interests, etc. And for us, it was very apparent that the university, when they decided that they wanted to pursue a midwifery programme, when they, they um, employed myself and Emma, that they really wanted this programme to develop leadership capability for impact. They wanted to develop research capability for evidence-based practice. Uh, they wanted some of our students to come back and work with us at the University of Birmingham for research. And they wanted graduates like lifelong learning, critical thinking, problem solving, et cetera. So sort of regular stuff that universities want, but that was particularly what we wanted. So nothing there really to to suggest to us that we particularly needed to bring women's voices in the into the classroom from those drivers. And then we move on to the things that started to make us think about um, how we were going to achieve some of our objectives. And one of the main drivers for any university midwifery program is standards of proficiency for midwives, the NMC standards. And in particular, there is uh, it's, um, split into six domains. And in particular, there's domain two, which looks at continuity of carer and how to give student midwives on graduation the foundation skills and knowledge that they need to be able to work in this model of care. Now, at the time we were developing, uh, NHS England were still actively trying to roll out continuity teams. I'm not saying they're not now, but this was pre Ockenden final report. In fact, the Ockenden report came out on the day that we approved our programme, where we found out that continuity of care teams may be being paused to some trust. 
But anyway, regardless, we didn't know about this at the time we were developing. Um, but all of the, the trusts we were working with are at different points in their journey for developing continuity of care, and some were further on than others. So we couldn't actually at the time guarantee that all of our student midwives would have a uh, placement experience in a continuity team. So whilst we decided to continue to use um, case loading, whereas students will look after a small group of women on a, a, during a, their final year generally, we started to think, was there something that we could do in the classroom that would actually support the preparation of student midwives to go out there and work in continuity of care teams? Because whilst case loading would do some of it, it wouldn't do all of it. So that's when we started to need to think outside of the box. One of our other drivers and driver in any program development was working with stakeholders. So the two groups that were particularly influential in terms of developing this virtual midwifery case, uh, caseload was our practice partners, so clinical midwives. Um, and the other group were service users and advocacy uh, group representatives. So our practice partners um, want lots of things, but thinking in particular about bringing women's voices in, they wanted our student midwives, they want all student midwives to be curious uh, when they, um, as midwives. So, you know, be curious about what is happening and why, you know, what, what, why is this woman bleeding or why, why is, um, uh, why am I seeing what I'm seeing? Why is this behavior happening? You know, why am why is this woman behaving in this way? What, what's going on in her life? You know, those sort of things. So sort of think about the, the whole, the sort of a holistic approach. They also, uh, and that's to do with safety, um, a lot of it to have a thinking midwife. Um, so their, their perspective was very much on safety. Also about reflection, thinking about why they've done things or why things have happened, but also as well challenge. They want student midwives to challenge, appropriate challenge, challenge themselves, um, challenge, you know, practice that is everyday practice that perhaps isn't particularly grounded in evidence, Ch you know, challenge poor practice, challenge, uh, you know, advocate for women, those sorts of things. So we were um, really starting to um, see a picture of what we needed to um, achieve, which was centering curiosity around centered around women as much as practice and then we went with our service users and our um advocacy group representatives we had a fantastically wide demographic we had service users that were representing their own experience um of maternity services but we had and we still do work with um advocacy groups who um advocate for different groups of women so we had um work with bereavement charity perinatal mental health charity um uh group that works with women with larger uh bodies uh, pregnancy sickness support uh and very closely with birth trauma uh, association uh, to name but a few um and what they uh told us was that we're asking that they wanted women to center the needs and desires of women in their practice. They want uh, midwives to listen, uh, to consider the context of their lives, not just the pregnancy or the baby. They don't want to be invisible. They wanted midwives to inquire just the same as directors of midwifery wanted to observe and to listen and to believe them. And really what they were asking for was individualized and personalized care. So we kind of, this all you know, was moving together, coming together. And we started to think, well, how are we going to achieve all of this? And layering that on, how are we going to achieve domain two, which is continuity of carer? So we thought about how um, quite often we'll use experts by experience in the classroom leading sessions, but obviously we're talking about crammed curriculum. We can't have everybody in as much as we would love to. Or um, a lot of... Uh, uh, one of the main ways that midwifery tutors might teach is to talk about a, a particular subject, gestational diabetes, for example, and then do some case studies at the end. The problem with that is that the midwifery tutor is normally the one that chooses the case study. It's quite often based on their clinical experience, uh, sometimes shaped to fit the needs of the session, but it doesn't actually uh, provide the women's perspective. It's not her story. Um, so 
and it doesn't really support continuity of care. We thought about using um, a learning approach called inquiry-based learning, which I've had lots of experience in, as, as Sue's mentioned at the beginning, where students will look at a case study and it can be a very uh, rounded case study. But uh, and they go away and they investigate it and they come back as a group and they they actually present their findings to the rest of the class and we discuss their findings and we reflect on things. The problem is that's just a weekly case study. That's one case study a week. And again, it doesn't specifically prepare students for continuity of care. And again, most often those case studies are made up by midwives, uh, midwife educators or or. Uh, gained from uh, practicing midwives and sometimes by women but they're not specifically about their experience and they're not usually told in the midwives uh, the women's own words so we really liked EBL we wanted to build on that and we were thinking about okay maybe we should think about using an unfolding case study because that will more closely represent what happens with the midwife that's working in a continuity team is that she gets to know that woman and she sees her regularly and things unfold um, so it sort of captures the not only the context of the woman's life, but the dynamic nature of pregnancy and, and you know, women's experiences and things. But again, it doesn't mirror the caseloading because it's one um, case that unfolds over a period of time. So we started to explore having caseloads running simultaneously. Can you move to the next slide, Claire, please? Um, so we we obviously being uh, professor, associate professors and assistant professors, we we hit the books and had a look to see could we find anything out there that looked similar or the same as what we wanted, and what we we couldn't find anything uh, exactly the same. And what that uh, told us really was that either um, not many people are doing it, or they're not publishing on it. But there was enough to give us um, a positive picture that if you use uh, unfolding case studies and you use more than one of them at a time, then it will have positive outcomes on learner experience and other uh, outcomes. Um, students really like to um, have learning experience that reflect practice. So that's a tick there. Um, we want them to have opportunities to revisit things as well and to see things in the round, as I've mentioned. We want students to have a safe, environment in which to test their thoughts and ideas and so on and we want them to develop key graduate skills and what we did find which was most encouraging was that from the sm small amount of evidence that was out there that using simultaneous you know uh, unfolding case stud uh, studies together so that we could actually develop some of these case loading management and team working skills can you move on to the next slide claire please um, so we decided to develop a simple framework to guide the development. In fact, this underpins the, the whole curriculum and other, we're, we're just about to start a, a BSc apprenticeship and this um, underpins that as well. So it's not just for the MSc programme. So uh, service users told us that they want midwives to centre women. We decided that if we can't expect midwives to do that if we're not centering women in student learning. So these are the, this is the golden thread then that runs through our programme that it's about women's uh, voices. Um, uh, all learning starts with women's voices and that lectures and seminars are organized around these case studies so that they complement women's stories, so they give the opportunity for us and students together to unpick. So for example, if we're using a case study of a woman who is perhaps uh, pregnant with twins and she has preeclampsia, and, you know, maybe she has other children at home, one with particular needs or so on, you know, that we can actually have lectures that revolve around that. So we can have a lecture on preeclampsia and we can have a lecture on uh, multiple uh, births and things like that. Um, so we obviously that that was a main premise. And and whilst we wanted to optimize sort of transformative learning and we we were excited to be able to offer this on a digital platform as well, which really aligned with the fact that it was a blended learning program, we thought very carefully about the stories that we would use. So we decided that we needed to use case studies supplied by uh, women so that they were from their perspective. So we put out a call. Um, via some of the advocacy groups that we were working with and via a Facebook page. And we were absolutely inundated with women who wanted to share their stories. 
Um, most of them wanted to share because of what had happened to them. And they they wanted learning from that. It was important that that there was learning from that. Um, but it, within these stories, there was high levels of trauma evident from uh, many women. And some of the stories were were quite harrowing, um, partly because they're written in their own words and you you open up an email and there's a story um, that you weren't expecting. But but in any case, um, we and there were obviously themes there, you know, poor communication, not listening, not believing, not using evidence based practice, all of the things that our stakeholders had told us we needed to think about in the curriculum. These women were just mirroring that. So we contact, we had to sift through them. Uh, we contacted, we thanked women. We contacted some of them to explore further with them if we could use their case cases in our virtual caseload. We met with them. We talked through their um, experiences. We wrote down the narratives. We talked about what we would need from them. So we would, what the time commitment would be, what maybe the emotional commitment would be, because a lot of these women had not really worked through problems that they had experienced and then thinking about how we could support them further and this was something particularly when Claire came in with her background um, in perinatal mental health was how are we going to support these women because this is a learning experience for students but it's also an experience for women but anyway and then we had to order them and, and Claire has done a lot of that work because she leads our virtual midwifery caseload so if we have maybe students are looking at three to six cases a week we need to make sure that they're all beautifully ordered so that actually some of the content of those stories happen at the right time for that student in their journey or to coincide with modules. Um, uh, and so that was really quite uh, time consuming. Can you move to the next slide, please? Last slide for me. Um, so just thinking about uh, the, the detail here then. So it may not be clear at the moment. Hopefully the, the fact that we're using women's stories is clear, um, but we have put them together as a virtual caseload. So every week that students are in theory block, uh, they will open up this um, uh, virtual learning environment called LT, and they will have a little introduction that will tell them, these are the women that you are going to be seeing this week. And we try and, align the the virtual appointments along with antenatal care or postnatal care um or if it's in if if it's in labor we we uh they maybe just have one woman that they look at that week and we will give them a sort of an unfolding story as they go through so they open this up and then they click on the name of, of a woman and they see uh often they'll see a video and the video is of a woman in her own words telling the students about her uh, anticipated experience. So I, you know, I'm now 34 weeks pregnant. I'm just about to go and see the community midwife. These are the things that I'm, you know, this is what's happening, going on at the moment. Um, and they finish watching the video. We give them some clinical information as well. This is her blood pressure. This is her blood results. You know, don't forget to look back because you remember you saw her four, you know, four weeks ago. Um, and then we ask them to develop a plan of care. And when they've done that, they have to commit it. So they can't move on to the next page until they click a commit button. And that means they can't go back and change their mind about the plan of care. And then we show them another video where, where we have it with, of the woman then saying, OK, this was the experience I had. And actually, I really wanted to talk about and a really common one is I wanted to talk about the fact that I want a cesarean section as for my birth next time. And the midwife didn't ask me she was more interested in asking me about smoking cessation and I don't smoke so the students will see that again in the woman's own words and then we ask them to go back and reflect did you did you miss anything because I know you know because this woman is talking about her experience with an actual midwife in real life but did they miss a cue perhaps so it really gives the opportunity for them to think about their professional development and then we, we meet with them once a week for a, a tutorial that lasts an hour and we will go through the stories with them and we will talk to them and they will talk about practice and we will talk about practice and then it all rounds nicely uh, and then they move on to the next week. And that's it from me. I'm going to hand over to Claire now to talk about the research. Okay, thank you, Teresa. So, yeah, a part, as part of a module evaluation, but also 
as um, <laughs> to complete my own MSc dissertation, um, we engaged in an evaluation with the students of our first cohort. It was a kind of midpoint evaluation. We invited them to complete a questionnaire, which most of them did. In fact, nine out of 12 did, which was wonderful. And um, three students actually attended a semi-structured interview. So we really wanted to get um, some depth of what their experience was um, learning in this way. Um, and there were some key themes um, that emerged and some of these really will um, weave all the way through the student feedback that you'll be hearing. Um, they really shared that their learning experiences led them to feel prepared for clinical placement. And I think that probably is the, the, one of the strongest themes that we picked up um, from the VMC work that they did. It enabled a shared development of critical skills and of clinical reasoning. Um, it enabled them to feel like they were learning in a safe space. So they, um, um, took part in a number of these activities in an independent, asynchronous way, um, and then came together as a tutorial on a weekly basis where the whole cohort um, joined one of us um, as educators and we facilitated and held space for them then to share their work. We gave sort of general feedback. We talked about specific themes um, that they had um, engaged with in, in that week. And that was also importantly a safe space for them and generated a community of inquiry um, but you know one of the things that really came through with this evaluation was this shared sense of learning that came from the emotional context of the narratives of, of how the women were portraying their feelings regarding their care not just what it kind of clinically um, was offered to them in, in their sort of antenatal appointments, for example, but also prompted them to consider how was their compassionate or, um, or not, how was it personalised or not, and they could um, kind of engage with their own thinking, their own experiences, um, and then reflect on those both personally as they got the feedback directly within their VMC work, but then also in the tutorial as well. So it's bringing that real life humanist perspectives into the digital platforms, bridging midwifery theory and practice-based learning and vice versa as they went out to practice. They then brought their experiences into their VMC work essentially. Um, so their perceptions, and, and this demonstrates some of the key terms um, for the benefit of those that will be listening on the podcast, as I usually do, um, they really were able to draw, draw on some complex cases, they could really get a sense of women's own experiences, they could build on their own knowledge and skills, um, and, and put these into practice, um, and they felt a real sense of value in this um, real life essentially um, they were building on their current knowledge and skills for our, this cohort who were nurses becoming midwives um, some of that transferability of their clinical experiences as well and in the sense of evaluating it, um, they really did evaluate the VMC work um, extraordinarily well. They found it involved well. Um, as Teresa mentioned, it, it runs as a long, thin module that really complements the shorter modules that, you ha that we have in universal care, in, in enhanced care, um, in complex needs. Um, and we were able to kind of really construct um, almost some flip learning, really, of setting them some activities that they had to seek some answers for themselves and then would go on to engage with that in, in more depth um, through the seminars and lectures, but then also through the, um, the tutorials, too. Um, they fed back that they felt engaged with this. Um, the VMC enabled them to figure out their own path within their learning. They could recognise some weaknesses in their understanding and seek um, kind of further resources and learning within that. Um, so one example um, of resources that we signposted them to as part of their VMC clinic, for example, there was one around hand expressing um, and they used that video resource that we I think it was a UNICEF one that we signposted them to. They then used that on the ward to support a woman that they were um, caring for antenatally. Another one used local breastfeeding support, signposting um, when they were on a postnatal ward. Again, getting to know the kind of local services and availability and the resources that they could then put in into actual practice. So they really felt they were able to expand on their own skills and knowledge, um, as one student said. 
Um, so some of the quotes that we gained um, in this feedback, I think it's really important to spotlight the student voice in this respect, just as we do spotlight the women's voices as well. Um, so one stated, personally, I feel learning from the lived experiences makes it, it more realist. It opens our eyes to what actually happens in areas through the maternity journey, it highlights needs for improvement and enables me to think back to practice and why some things might be carried out differently. So that context, again, um, adds that's something that is powerful and emotive to the, the learning that they're doing. Knowing that you know the people have taken the time to tell their stories was highly valued. Um, and students' exposure to lived experience in preparation for practice enabled them to reflect on where real services gave good or not so good care. And again, just some of the feedback that the students gave us in the sense of having more valuable women um, finding more value in women's experiences than constructed teaching, particularly comments about the service provided or how the women felt after contact with midwives. It helped me to consider what I could do differently and what could be improved in the care that they received. And again, seeking value through seeing women talk about their experiences, you get a sense of how their birthing experience affected them. It feels more personal than being told or reading about um, how women feel. And, and, and again, in this sense, they could really kind of unpick the details in the these clinical and um, care experiences that enabled them to think about non-linear decision making um, demonstrated within branch learning, allowing students to kind of manipulate their learning journey. That, and that authenticity of the videos really did um, enforce that. And as kind of wider literature, such as the Phillips et al. Um, study that um, Teresa mentioned earlier um, in the sense of uh, virtual clinics really um, being reflective of the different levels of practice experience that the students may have, whether it's in preparation for their first um, placement or um, that they're drawing on previous placement experiences um, in preparation for the next as well. Development of critical skills and clinical reasoning. What was important for the students is getting a deeper sense of those experiences, as we've already said, um, but also in the sense of thinking about what was more challenging as well. Um, as Theresa mentioned, um, many shared their experiences that were very difficult and, and what they perceived as, as traumatic. And we had to be very sensitive around these shared experiences, just not just from the women's perspective, although we did obviously need to hold space and make sure they were safe and felt protected in sharing their stories, but also from a student perspective, respecting um, that some of our students are um, mothers themselves that have had different clinical experiences that may have been traumatic. And um, so from a traumatic informed education perspective as well, again, we're very um, strongly um, in favour of creating a safe environment for them to share their learning, but also to feel personally safe as well. And it was really important um, to navigate that for them. So not knowing the um, the journey is not always a smooth or easy one for the students. And, and thankfully, they were honest in expressing that within this evaluation. Um, as one student shared, it can fa felt frustrating sometimes. And I think a few did feel this way, particularly when it was a new topic, a new area of care that they haven't experienced yet. So when there were um, topics, as this student said, that I felt I didn't know anything about or had not experienced in practice, trying to write a plan for something felt difficult. And I needed to investigate what was out there. There to write the plan, um, the process felt disjointed and time consuming. That this could be seen as a positive. So, as part of her re reflective journey and her learning, um, she then recognised why it felt difficult and her own emotions connected with that. And actually, kind of sometimes wading through or exploring, or that curiosity that Teresa um, talked about was about being prepared much better for the practice situations. So, again, as we've already said, and uh, what the objectives for the VMC was creating a safe learning space, and then through the tutorial. Um, in the sense of that community of inquiry, managing that sense of anticipation, um, of really kind of thinking about the critical thinking and clinical reasoning, um, and the vicarious learning as well that was both anticipated and realised then through the tutorials, um, sharing their experiences because they'd been on different placements, for example, or they're um, based in different trusts and the different um, kind of care experiences that might be associated with different hospitals. Um, and um, again, creating that space where they felt able to share 
uh, even if they weren't really sure about what they were learning or, or what the answers were. So the tutorial was really kind of unpicking themes that were addressed in the VMC at the beginning. It might be in a bit more detail of going through things um, really case by case. But as LOA et al's got findings outlined, there was a sort of three layer model really for the design of virtual clinics. This inner layer that was around the student's cognition, the middle layer that was thinking about the virtual patient, the virtual woman as an encoded object to be decoded or as a kind of constructed activity. And then the outer layer that describes a sort of cognitive and behavioral change. So that that motion and that transition for the students and that kind of aligns to through the tutorial, having a social presence, so bringing the students in and back together, that cognitive presence in the sense of them sharing their learning, but also that vicarious learning, and then a teaching presence. So with having an academic present as a midwife with their shared clinical experience, but also in holding space um, in students be able to communicate together and developing those kind of shared communication skills as well um, was very much part of an ongoing activity and something um, I think the students really favoured um, in general from the feedback that they gave, um, especially where the, chase, the, the cases were challenging um, and particularly where they read and, you know, different resources were sharing their evidence based approaches. And so they're yeah, particularly at this level, at a master's level, they were really sharing their critical thinking and unpicking things at a, at a much deeper level. So just to summarise, um, the future of the VMC, we're constantly looking um, at how we can improve it. Um, I'm evaluating the next um, cohorts experiences and I'm, I'm going to be evaluating the, the second years, the, the ones that um, took part in this evaluation are now second year. So I want to seek how they're getting on in, in this year of their VMC work. We definitely need to consistently increase the diversity of women and families and their voices, um, reflecting more the local communities where these students are working and attending practice and those, those women and families that they are caring for, looking to sort of continue to develop the digital way that they engage with the VMC and technology um, and their digital skills, but also perhaps mimicking things like the badger net and the way that um, their documentation in practice takes part. Um, and again, just thinking to engage with feedback. So essentially the VMC personalizes learning experiences. Um, students can work independently. They can value being able to safely make mistakes, but essentially shape their own midwifery learning and their midwifery care by conducting perhaps a consultation that's not just mirroring or parroting what somebody or like a pr practice supervisor might might do, but also um, navigating their own kind of clinics in their own real time um, as a midwife themselves, taking the mechanism of that space and time frame to mimic a true midwifery experience. Um, and that's me.